Welcome back, Gators. Are you ready to travel to the Netherlands? Good, because today's story took place on Halloween in the year 1959. The case bears an eerie resemblance to last week's coverage of Rosemarie Nitribit, so I thought it'd be interesting to publish them close together. So let's have a listen. Sibylla Alida Johanna Niemans was born on the 27th of September 1927 in today's Amsterdam West, a western borough of the capital. Amsterdam West was formed in 2010 through the merging of four former boroughs, Oud West, Wester Park, De Barsjes and Bozen Lommer. This part of Amsterdam was built roughly between the end of the 19th century and the year 1960. This means that during Sabila's time, multiple urban expansion projects were being carried out, and the borough was ever-changing. In 2013, Amsterdam West had approximately 142,700 inhabitants. That's about 14,000 residents per square meter, making it the capital's most densely populated borough. Sibylla lived in Amsterdam with her parents, Hendrikus Johannes Niemans, who was born in 1899, and Sibylla Alida Johanna Streelder, who was born in 1900. She also had an older brother, whose name is unknown. At the time of her birth, Sibylla's father worked as a shoemaker, which is such a skilled profession, hats off to him. Meanwhile, her mother's profession was not disclosed but it can be assumed that she was not employed due to suffering from a chronic illness, which likely meant that she stayed home to look after the kids the best she could. When Sibylla was just a child, her mother's condition would begin to worsen, to the point of her needing help with the smallest daily routines, and eventually all around care. Thus, she was admitted to a local hospital by her husband. With Hendrikus being at work all day and having to provide for his family and particularly pay the hospital bills for his ill wife, there was nobody around to take care of Sibylla and her brother. Sadly, the father saw no other choice but to send the kids off to a children's home in Zandvoort, a 25-minute train ride away. She would attend both primary and secondary school until the Germans arrived during World War II. They then claimed the building in 1942 and Sibylla went back to Amsterdam with her brother. In the meantime, it appeared that her father had grown tired of looking after a chronically ill wife and divorced her mother. When the kids arrived home, they were greeted not only by their papa, but also by their father's new squeeze, who would quickly take a strong dislike to Sibylla. In fact, they wouldn't get along at all which drove the still underage Sibylla to pack her bags and move out. Can't blame her. Unfortunately for Sibylla, she didn't really have a plan past getting away from her stepmother. And not knowing her future, she thought she'd do the next best thing and see a fortune teller. But their foretold revelation didn't help in terms of living in the real world. Shocker. So Sibylla took off to find herself a room to stay in. While she was out looking for accommodation, which wasn't the easiest thing to achieve as a minor, she came across an Italian sailor who was in fact a pimp. And as you guessed it, not only did he offer Sibylla a roof over her head in Kerkstraat, he also offered her a job. Luckily for her, the police soon learned of this young girl looking for a room in the city and intervened before things could get worse for her. Sibylla was then forced to return home once more, where she then began training as a costume seamstress. Later, she would move to a room at 71 Schelderstraat and around this time, she bleached her locks and became known in the neighborhood as Blonde Dolly. Sibylla made a decent income from selling her services to a local clientele, and at the beginning of 1950, she was able to buy her own property on 498 New Behave and that was to be a very successful year for her. Not only did she buy a house, she got married to Botto Vandenberg, a violinist of Haag's orchestra, whom she had actually met during work. Her husband was an accomplished musician, and Sibylla would often accompany him on trips abroad. 
and by being married to Botto, she also discovered the captivating world of classical music, art, and everything high fashion. So he really introduced her to a whole new world. From this moment onwards, Sibylla went by the name Vandenberg and quit her job as a woman of the night, choosing to work as a fashion model instead. She really wanted to reinvent herself and her husband gave her the motivation to do so. But unfortunately for her, their marital bliss wouldn't last. After only a year of marriage, the couple would begin to bicker until they eventually decided to go their separate ways. The divorce was finalized in 1957 following a long and very complex legal battle. The couple had no children. While their divorce battle was brewing, Sibylla began to work as a lady of the night again, and she outdid her previous success this time around. She in fact made such a large sum of money for the time that she purchased not one, but several properties in Den Haag, all of which she rented out. So with those properties generating an income, she was financially set. Sibylla became a wealthy businesswoman, but despite being a successful property investor, she'd still keep her side hustle going as a woman of the night. And while she transformed into blonde dolly at night, she also made sure to play her part in Holland's high society. She ran in very wealthy circles. But Sibylla wasn't all about the glitz and glamour. She pretty much devoted her life to charitable work, something that was very dear to her heart. She would read to patients in hospitals and retirement homes in Den Haag. And she'd read works of Guido Gesell and De Genestet. Her life had taken a positive turn at last. But it wasn't to stay that way. It was Monday, November the 2nd, 1959, when, just two years into her single life, Sibylla is found dead in her own bed. An acquaintance of hers had arrived at her home to pay her a visit and found it locked. They rang the doorbell and while waiting for her to open the door, they realized that her blinds were still shut and it was already late in the evening. They waited and waited, but Sibylla never opened the door and she was generally known as a woman that never missed a single appointment. She was dependable and always on time. Again, this was a successful businesswoman, juggling the management of several properties, a side hustle, high society memberships and regular charity visits. Sibylla had adopted a Bouvier de Flandre not too long ago, and when her acquaintance arrived at her house, they could hear the dog barking up a storm, and the dog never stopped. So after the call to the friend, they decided to call the police and have them check up on her. Two officers then arrived at her house and also rang the bell. When Sibylla didn't open again, they then went to her backyard and broke into her kitchen window to enter the property. They first looked around the ground floor but couldn't find her, nor did she answer any of their calls. They then went upstairs to the master bedroom, which was not the room she entertained her clients in. And that is where they discovered her body lying in her own bed. She was dressed in a thin white camisole and when they approached her, they noticed that she was no longer alive. However, the cause of her passing wasn't immediately clear. There was no sign of violence and a substantial amount of cash was found in the building by the police so robbery was ruled out as a motive. The body was then picked up and an autopsy was carried out, which determined that Sabilla had been strangled to death. The forensic analyst concluded that she had died either late Friday night or early on Saturday. As you can imagine, Sabilla's death caused quite a commotion in Den Haag's red light district. The ladies working there were feeling scared and unsafe despite no evidence of violence having been found at the scene. Which is funny, I mean strangulation is hardly non-violent. Still, people began to create the craziest stories and gossip soon began feeding the press. And one point of interest was Sibylla's notebook. You see, she had a so-called blue book, which contained the names of high-ranking regular clients, some of them active in politics. 
And since the police wouldn't release this notebook or its contents to the public, people began to suspect that one of the names in the book could be that of the murderer. Some rumors even suggested that her death was all part of a political cover-up. But no evidence was ever presented to suggest that any of this was true. When the international press caught whiff of a political cover-up, they soon linked her murder to that of Germany's Rosemarie Nitribit, whose case I covered in last week's video. Soon enough, the first suspect in Sabella's case emerged, and his name was Herard. Herard worked as a bodyguard, and he was the son of a famous politician. Sibylla had hired Herard in 1959 to protect her, after another lady of the night had been murdered just the previous year and close to Sibylla's house. According to some sources, Herard, however, didn't intend to keep things purely professional. He had fallen for Sibylla and fantasized about her on the daily. His supposed love for her soon turned into an obsession, to the point of him telling his family that the two were engaged. This, despite Sibylla rejecting his advances ten times over. But cops had a real reason to believe that Herard was guilty. And it wasn't the fact he lived in La La Land. On the day her body was removed from her home, Herard was actually in the house for unknown reasons. Cops then allegedly told him that Sibylla had died of natural causes, which is what they had in fact assumed at the time. However, later on, when Herard was in conversation with a friend of his, he told them that Sibylla was strangled. Something he couldn't have known, unless he was the killer. At this point, police hadn't even filled in the section stating her cause of death. So how would he know? Herard was then arrested by the police, but released not long after, as authorities failed to formally link him to the crime. There were of course people that didn't think Herard was guilty. They simply thought that it didn't make a lot of sense for him to have done it just because she didn't show an interest in him, which crazier things have happened. Those people thought that her death was likely the result of someone trying to keep her quiet. In addition to several politicians, Sibylla also counted a few other high society members among her clients. And to those men, reputation was everything. They did not want their nightly visits to her house becoming public knowledge. Some sources claim that through being in touch with these upper class men, Sibylla, through no fault of her own, came across classified information worth killing for. Her death, the death of a lady of the night, was a small price to pay for a gentleman's reputation. Interestingly, during this whole investigation, of which not much has been shared with the public, somehow someone managed to lose Sibylla's trusty notebook. Or did they? Soon, another rumor hit the newspapers. And it was alleged that the police had been paid off to cover this whole thing up. And this wasn't so far-fetched. The entire investigation into Sibylla's case was led by none other than the head of the Den Haag police, personally. Why would a senior member of his standing lead an investigation into the death of a woman of the night? This is highly unusual, unless he had a personal interest in it. In 1977, 18 years after her murder, the police closed her case, despite not having come up with a suspect or conclusion. They just had nowhere else to go. Prior to her death, Sibylla had written a will which dictated that all of her assets be left to the provincial hospital near Sandport, where her mother was being nursed, and to charities fighting cancer. Her assets included several properties and a ton of money in savings, meaning her ailing mom was set for life. Because Sibylla's murder has gone unsolved for such a long time, the public has come up with many theories. Some have wondered why she actually hired a bodyguard. Was it really to protect her from the crime in the neighborhood? Or was she being threatened by someone? They also wondered why the house was so well protected. Yes, she was a wealthy woman, but not many people had an alarm in the neighborhood back in the day. 
her windows too, had rolled down shutters covering them. And then there's the dog, Abouvier, not your typical pocket-sized dog adored by so many ladies. Did she need a larger dog to guard the house, to protect her? Did she feel that unsafe in her own home? Some also wondered whether perhaps the murder was the doing of a jealous wife. In her peak, Sibylla was estimated to entertain some 25 men per night. I don't know if this is feasible, but it would explain how she got so wealthy so quickly. Others claim that Sibylla didn't amass her fortune as a lady of the night at all, but that she instead worked as a Russian spy. However, while there is no lack of theories given people's imagination, no evidence exists to back up any of these. As with any unsolved case, people will speculate until the case is solved. Sibylla's life and death was eventually made into a novel called Murder on Black Martha by Michel Dubois, while Herit van Els directed Blonde Dolly in 1987. And that's curtains for today's case. It was a shorter vintage case, and we will be back to modern times next week. Ciao, Gators.